Hello, this is John Prenet from Ion Annapolis and the Maryland Crabs podcast with a special election crab cake episode for your listening pleasure. In June, we held a mayoral forum that was very, very well attended. And you can, and quite honestly, you should, go listen to that one. And you can find it on themarylandcrabs.com. But today, we bring you the voices of all of the other candidates running for alder person. Well, all but one of them. Republican candidate for Ward 1, Larry Clausen, did not respond to any of our requests. While we would have liked to have presented a forum or a debate with these 17 individuals, it just wasn't practical. So, we took it to the road so you can learn a little bit more about each of them in order to help us all make an informed vote. All of the questions were essentially the same to keep it fair, and we are releasing them all at the same time. Tune in and listen as your candidates answer some crucial questions about the city of Annapolis and how they plan to handle it should they be successful. Thanks for listening. Enjoy and be sure to vote. And we are here back at A Coffee in Eastport. We're speaking with Alderman Ross Arnett. How are you today? I'm just fine. Thank you. <laughs> good. Nice. Good. It's not raining. So that was yeah, good. Well, yesterday was a... What we needed it, but I'm glad we had gotten it behind us. What, a golly washer? Is that yeah. what the, some, yeah. somebody had... <laughs> And then it rained a lot last night too. Yeah. So, yeah. No, it was uh, it was tough. Um, well, let's let's get into it. I mean, you've been an alderman for Eastport for this will be my fourth. Fourth, okay. I'm right. bidding for my fourth full term. I've been for two full terms and most of the remainder of Josh's term. Three years of Josh's four-year term. Okay, so you came in as in a special election, or were you along with Sheila Finlayson, special election in late 2006? And okay, when Josh. Correct. Went over to the county council. Correct. Okay. You know, obviously know the ward very well. Um, What what are you seeing as the largest issues that are facing your constituents here specific to Ward 8? Well, of course, the bedrock one is always public safety. Mm -hmm. And um, nobody likes to hear shots fired. Nobody likes the fact that we had yet another incident last Thursday. So that is sort of an ongoing fundamental concern. You can't enjoy life in the ward without feeling safe. It's as simple as that. So that's one. A hot topic right now is the shopping center. Uh, so that that is certainly something. As my campaign literature talks about, Ward 8 is very environmentally conscious. I mean, I've been pleased to see that. So they've been very tuned in to the Forest Conservation Act work that I've been working on and the no net loss which I'm shocked and pleased that we got passed. But obviously, uh, environment also includes the built environment, the shopping center and Crystal Spring and all of the things that are going on, quite quite controversial. And and then finally, my uh, particular forte is the fiscal uh, soundness of the city and uh, something we have to keep working on all the time. But the public safety one is paramount and um, there's three things that I think we need to be doing on that, if, we, if you'll allow me to answer that now. <laughs> sure. I'm sure it'll be another question. Um, and I just sent an email to the chief, the city manager and the mayor about this. I think there's a three-prong approach. Obviously, community policing is something we're investing in. We've got to try. It's got to be more than 45 minutes out of the car on a shift. What people think of for community policing is foot patrols, period. We've got to push to get there. That's going to require more resources. The long-term solution, and I know people don't like hearing this, is we have to be better partners with the housing authority. We know where the crime is. We know why it's there. We know that we have to help them pull themselves up. We don't have money to help them, but we can be a very good partner. And I give Mayor Panelides a lot of credit for turning us around on that. The people we have on the Housing Authority Board. And I think we do, I didn't think we could save public housing. Now I think there's a chance. It's a long shot. But if we make them better, we're all gonna be better off. If we give them pride of ownership, they're not gonna wanna have bad elements and they're not gonna want people in the community that are gonna allow the bad elements there. So, but that is, when I talk to Jess Packer about this, that's a long-term investment, long-term project, and she impatiently stamps her foot and says, right. no, I, I want it now. The thing that I don't think we've focused on enough, and it's not 
shot spotters, the thing we had the meeting on a couple of months ago, but there is technology that allows us with artificial intelligence, NSA had it developed by Johns Hopkins Applied Laboratory. The artificial intelligence sees something with all the cameras that we're now getting deployed. There's an obvious crime situation. It zeroes in on it and it hands off to other cameras. So just like in London, when they were tracing those people all throughout this. So that's deploy deploying technology and increasing our productivity and giving us a much better shot at uh, corralling the perpetrators and more importantly, making them feel unsafe to operate in the community. So this is something I actually had been deep into discussions with Chief Christoph before he left and now in uh, picking up that thread with Chief Baker, we, we have to take advantage of the technologies that allow us to capture these people. There is a fourth rail, however, and this is something that Chris Duke complained to me a lot. He knew who the people were that were responsible for many of those 10 murders, but he couldn't build a case strong enough for Wes Adams to prosecute him. When he finally got the case that was strong enough, they were arrested and murders stopped. Now, that didn't mean that we're not gonna have more murders. We will, because we have a bad situation. But the fourth strand of this public safety, which started off with Speaker Bush, Ellen Moyer was mayor when we started the Safe Streets program. And with that was Bush getting- With Bush and O'Malley. With Bush and O'Malley, and that was getting all of the administrative agencies, all the adjudicators, all the prosecutors, in the same room to meet once a month and talk about stuff. That has kind of frittered away, and we need to breathe life back into that. But when you got the juvie people talking to the parole people and the sheriff's department talking to the county police, talking to the city police, that kind of coordination also lends to results. So I know I took a long time talking about public safety, but I bet I didn't take a long enough time to, according to some of my constituents. It is a very important issue. I have invested a lot of time. I go to all the Housing Authority board meetings now. I'm trying to encourage them and help them. And I think the city is going to have to partner with them to go to where the money is, which is both in the private sector, but at higher levels of government. Because we get them turned around, I think we're going to turn this crime, this safety situation around. Crime and development are the top two, as you've said here, in Eastport and Ward 8. And for those that are listening, Eastport essentially is the peninsula that comes between Spa and Back Creek right? Uh, and kind of ends real generally at where Hilltop, which I guess is mm -hmm. called Tyler at that Tyler, point, hits right. Bay Ridge. Right. Do you feel that the issues that you're facing your ward are the same issues citywide because you obviously represent the city as well as the right. ward? Or does the city in general have some more issues? that I think... Uh, the, the safety situation is a generic, a citywide. Uh, Newtown 20, Robinwood, the, the crime is there. The conditions of the housing, Newtown 20 housing conditions are despicable. I mean, it's virtually inhuman. So I think on that level, and we like to travel around the city, when you travel into a no man's land, you, public safety is going to be paramount. When people hear about it, they may not take their trip to Annapolis and those sorts of things. So it really is pervasive. I think Eastport is, has no public housing in Ward 8, but it certainly has a big congregation of public housing right next door. So that is general. Development is somewhat variable, but it is, it's forced drive and all of its uh, uh, permutations. And Eastport has two ways out, over the bridge or out to Forest Drive. And we are a peninsula, and we are really experiencing a lot of development now. The most noteworthy impact of that is traffic. It's very hard to turn, make a left-hand turn out of any of the side streets in Eastport. And uh, people are feeling it. It's very different than when I moved here 15 years ago. It's notably different. And people are really sensing that. And uh, there is a certain amount of, hey... Uh, I didn't bargain for this, and why are we letting more and more people in? There's a word for that that I won't use, but it is <laughs> it, it applies. Um, and so I think that people are looking at why. I mean, why do we need 
more apartments as opposed to more shopping. Uh, that's a cry I hear a lot. I, I want more shopping, not more neighbors. I, I do think that there needs to be better work on the part of the planning staff to allocate appropriately. There are apartments that are going empty for rent in Eastport, while at the same time we're contemplating building a new apartment building. There is plans on the part of the Watergate people to double the size. We're going to have a glut of apartment buildings in Eastport, and we're going to have all the parking and traffic problems that come with that, and we got to be planning for that. Well, that just bring me into my next question to you. Where do you, uh, as a representative of Ward 8, stand on development in general? I mean, obviously the two hot topics right now are Providence Point, also known as Crystal Spring, and the landings here at Eastport right. Shopping Center. So without development, a city dies. And redevelopment is inevitable. Buildings wear out. This shopping center was built in 1969. Uh, I still like it and I think it's very serviceable, but it's, it is running towards the end of its engineering life. Uh, Watergate, the apartment buildings there do not meet current building codes, and they really should be torn down and rebuilt and made more modern. Those kinds of things have to happen, but I would argue that this is a planning function and that our planning people ought to be looking at all of the potential development in a particular region, maybe do it by wards, maybe some other region, and say, this needs to be redeveloped, that needs to be redeveloped, there's space for development here, but we need to prioritize it. Right now, we just take it as it comes, you know, first come, first serve. There was a little bit in the last comp plan to create the opportunity areas. All of Annapolis is an opportunity area. We are a very good investment, we're very attractive, a lot of people want to be here. We cannot satisfy all that demand to be in Annapolis without fundamentally changing Annapolis to Bethesda or Northern Virginia. And I don't think that's good for us. I don't want to live in that Annapolis personally. And I don't think that we should just open our arms and let it happen to us. I think we really do need to plan for it. And, and so in the next comprehensive plan, we have really got to focus more on looking at all the potential development coming up with metrics to rationalize it. For me, redoing Eastport Terrace and Harbor House is priority one through 10 in terms of redevelopment that I'd like to see happen because of the social benefits to the residents and the safety benefits to the rest of us. And it just needs to be done. I don't know if we're gonna hear all of this with that noise. Right, but <laughs> right, no. Um, all right, I've, I've talked to most of the candidates and I'm, I'm forming my own prognostication and guesses for crystal balling for the election. I don't see a super majority on the council. I think you're going to have a uh, Republicans and Democrats and you know, perhaps a Republican What's wrong with that? Democrat mayor. But how do, how do you as an alderman, you, you serve through Lawyer, a, a Republican and, 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 a, and, and, a, and a Democrat, and a two Democratic mayors. How do you reach across the aisle? How do you bridge the gap between the Republican and the two parties? As um, I think it's very easy to reach across the aisle. What you need to do is what the city needs. And at the local level, I don't think that comes with a political label. That may sound trite or whatever, but I frankly have enjoyed working with the current mayor more. I think I've had more success with him than I did either of his two predecessors. And in fact, I have a very cordial relationship with this mayor. I did with uh, Alderman, I mean, uh, Mayor Cohen. I knew him first as Alderman. Uh, Ellen Moyer and I didn't get along on a lot of issues. And the thing about Ellen is you never have to worry about where you stand with her. <laughs> and <laughs> Absolutely she let me true. know that I was not viewed positively <laughs> fairly early in my tenure. So, but I, I don't think local issues, traffic is not political, development is not political, safety is not political. And you have to have as your guiding light what is good for the city and how you best get there. One of my best friends on the council is Fred Payone. Uh, we go out to lunch all the time and we talk about these issues all the time. So, you know, I, I know why we have partisan politics, but I'm not sure at the local level. We're only one of three 
jurisdictions and municipalities in the entire state that have partisan elections. I'm not sure what that does for us. Uh, I am a Democrat, and particularly on social issues, I very strongly espouse Democrat principles. But I get accused by a lot of people on my fiscal policies of being a Republican or a rhino or a dino. I don't care what you call me as long as I get the job done, you know, and, and you call me for dinner. <laughs> Fair, yeah, there you go. Fair enough. Well, this this um, I think I know probably know the answer to the next two questions. And I want you to sort of throw yourself under the bus here a little bit. But looking yep. back on the council in the last four years, what do you look at that has happened on the council that you go? Why the hell did we do this? Or this was a, really the most boneheaded thing we could have done. I'm, I'm not sure about, I mean, I'm sure we've done a lot of boneheaded things, but I, I regret more of the things that we haven't done and that I haven't done. So I have a long list of things that I want to hit the ground running should I be fortunate enough to be reelected. But the planning function, the planning department took the biggest cuts under the uh, financial difficulties we had at the beginning of the Cohen administration. And it's the one that I think needs the most help. And I think it's the one that affects our lives day to day more than anything else. Other than clean water in and dirty water out, traffic is what we have to deal with as we do our daily living. And um, I, I should have gotten on to revising Title 21 earlier, and I regret not having the time to do that. And it's one of the things that I really want to hit right out of the starting gate if I'm reelected. So um, boneheaded things, I mean, of course, when you're, when you're in the hot seat, you don't tend to think of it. You tell me a boneheaded <laughs> thing you think, and I'll tell you how, what I think about it. The rec center, I didn't vote to sell. I wanted to keep it and lease it to the Maryland Environmental Group. We would have kept it as an asset, and we would have had them re rehab the building for us, which would have improved the value of the asset. And we would have environmental, you know, uh, sea level people with their feet in the water right down there where it floods all the time. So I, I don't regret my actions. I do regret the council <clears throat> selling that. It does put it on the tax rolls. And I think that the, the Leo Wilson's plans will be beautiful, preserving what was good about that building. The golf course, I was also, I did not want to sell it because it was an income generating asset. But I have a hard time justifying the city being in the golf course business in the county when uh, we have a lot of other needs that we need to take care of in the city. And I will be the first to admit the, the city has not shown itself to be a good property manager. Um, I think the market house is certainly the really thorny, burning issue there. And I don't think we should try to be in the property managing. So I had long, um, and you can ask him, uh, hard sessions with Steve Shu about whether we should sell it, because that was really something he wanted very badly. The way I justified that sale is we'll get a new Truxton Park pool for it without incurring more debt. I play there. I love the course. I hope the county does right by it. They have the $5 million or more. I think it's going to be like 10 to invest to bring it back up to par. <laughs> pun intended. There's a pun. <laughs> yeah. Um, and we don't. And when we have the trade-offs that we need to be making, I, as much as I wanted to keep it, I couldn't justify it. So I, I don't, maybe that's why I'm having a hard time thinking of that as a bonehead move. I, I think it was a move we didn't have much choice in making. For a moment, assume that the city is on the brink of insolvency. Some people might make the argument that it is, some may make the argument that it's not, but let's I just don't think we're far away. that it is. What is on the table for you? What specific things are you looking to do to help write that? So there's only two macro level choices. One is find more revenue. And the only discretionary re revenue we have is property tax. Now, I think we've pushed that one pretty hard. And I think you can go too far and get into a real estate death spiral. The other is to cut costs. Now, there's two ways you can cut costs. You can cut functions or you can invest in technology and become more efficient. Efficiencies usually lead to less staff uh, because you don't need as many. The capital investment 
So like what I was talking about in investing in that smart intelligence, artificial intelligence for the crime solving, that's a way that we don't need to have and all the additional police officers we're going to have to hire on over and above what we've done in order to have true community policing. So you've got to invest smartly. Lord knows there are a lot of technological, but the, the downside of the co cutting cost is it inevitably means jobs. And the downside of that, particularly for a Democrat, is we know who are likely to be the first to go and they know who are likely to be the first to go. And that's why this is a real third rail issue. I think that any downsizing in that regard is like what we did with the downsizing after we privatized the trash. We have to uh, offer the employees affected two alternatives, one of which is a city alternative, the other is with the contractor. All of our guys chose to stay. They're still on the rolls. Their, lot, their jobs are redlined. As they you know, retire, we'll see some of that saving. But if we're in a real fiscal crisis, what did we do the last time? We fired 33 staff, and we probably uh, we weren't successful in keeping all of those staff. I think really only 14 people were actually fired and stayed off the walls. And we really needed to fire more if that's the way we were going to do it. And in fact, I will be honest, I encouraged Mayor Cohen to let more people go. My, what I favor in, term, in terms of letting people go, though, is we have to let go of whole functions. We can't just look at individuals and lop them off. That way, we're, we're letting go the high-paid people as well as the lower-paid people. Those are terrible, painful choices, and I remember the agony that we all went through when we had to let those people go. You're, you're talking about somebody's life and livelihood, and those are not easy decisions. But in my campaign, I talk about the looming liabilities, and I don't think we're that far away from another fiscal crisis. Hopefully it won't be as big as that one, but our revenues are not keeping pace with our spending. Tom Andrews, the city manager, has done a magnificent job of juggling things and keeping us above water, but I think the uh, ability to continue to do that is very limited. I've tried to warn the mayor about it, tried to warn him that, you know, this is his last term. If we have a big financial crisis in the middle of it, he wants to move on to higher elected office. Uh, no mayor has ever managed to do that, but I wish him success on that. But you're not going to do it if you have a big financial uh, blow up in the, uh, towards the end of your second term. You know, we need to be, we need to get in front of this. We, with all of these things, we can't just wait and kick the can down the road and let it happen to us. We really need to be looking forward. I really do think that the city has done a very good job, and I'm proud of the part that I've played in that, in improving our fiscal management systems. But if you're not getting, bringing in as much money as you're spending, it's called deficit spending. We know what it looks like at the national level. We can't print money. Now, I do think we could use some help from the higher levels. I think that a source of income that we could immediately tap into is we pay out much more in personal income tax than we retain in our 17% piggyback on the county, 50% uh, piggyback. I think that would be fair. Why should our high income, income taxes go out to subsidize the county? Why can't we keep that in the city? Why can't we have a share of the sales tax? That would do two wonderful things. It gives us another source of income free. It gives us a very steady flow. And third, it marries us to the business community. Right now, business is bad. Gee, that's too bad. Business is good. Gee, that's good for you, but it isn't doing anything because the only thing we see is the property tax revenue. And parking is another looming thing that we're going to have to deal with. I think. Smart cars, I mean, the, the driverless cars down the road will solve. We don't think we'll need as much parking, but that's, you know, 10 years away. It's certainly further away than I will be serving in city government. <laughs> and so the parking issue is in Hillman Garage. Uh, I was just talking with Public Works about it before I came to this meeting. we got to do something. Are we going to patch it up again and limp along? That's probably the prudent thing to do, and it won't 
we won't have another big debt issuance. But when and if that garage comes down, there is going to be weeping and gnashing of tears on Main Street because nobody's going to be coming down there. Nobody, no employees are going to be able to park there. Neither ours nor the businesses, nor our customers going to come down because they know there's no parking. All right, so you're obviously running for the money that they pay you, the 14000 <laughs> the 14000 13, five, um, but it's going up, big uh -huh. increase. Yeah. I've often said that aldermen are volunteer, it's a volunteer position. 15000 or whatever it is, is, is merely a stipend and uh, certainly well below the, probably the minimum wage right. to that. What amount of time do you invest in to this, back into the citizens of Ward 8 and in doing your job? I can ask, I mean, if you were, never on this council, I could sit there and say, well, how much do you plan to? But right. you obviously have, yeah. how much time do you spend now, doing I, your I, stuff? I spend a lot. Uh, I mean, virtually every day, I spend all day and into the night. I am working harder now than I was as a senior executive for the federal government, and it takes it. Look at who we're losing on the council. Two really good people in Jared and Ian, and I have, actually have a lot of respect for uh, Alderman Kirby as well, they they can't put in the time, and I know they both feel because they are full time and they have young families. You just can't do it, and you have to cut corners. Alderman Kirby can't do it because he really does need an income stream. He can't live on his alderman salary. You know, Rhonda says she has a hard time because she does have a full time job, but most of us don't. Most of us are retired, and most of us are doing this because we like doing it and we're willing to do it, not because it's rewarding and not because it's easy. It's tough. I know it when my constituents are unhappy with me and I feel it and I feel it very personally. Um, and it's not a good feeling, but I work really hard to try to do the best I can for them. And that means a lot of long hours. And I do always want to work for a win-win solution. I feel very strongly that I have to uphold my oath as alderman to protect the charter and the code, the city code, and make sure that we follow that or change it. And that's one of, that's my big issue. Right. So, but anyway, no, I work very hard. Um, and uh, day and into the night, as you well know, some nights really late. Um, yes, I've seen some AM on some emails coming from you. <laughs> right. Yes. Um, and it takes it. Um, if you're gonna do the job right, now, I will admit that I probably spread myself too thin because I'm interested in everything. I don't pick my spots well. So I'm interested in safety and transportation and traffic and development and all of it. And I probably could focus a little bit more and not have to work as hard. It's just not my character. I throw myself into the job. How do you, I know, I know how you have so far, do you, uh, you do town hall meetings. Um, I'm very proud of that. Community meetings, you do that quarterly? I try to, it's not quite quarterly. It's I would say at um, least twice a year is probably a fair. I know when there's an issue, a big issue. I know when the uh, Eastport Shopping Center renovation was coming up. I mean, you held a, a special meeting for that and whatnot and brought the mayor in and planning and zoning together. Same with the Yacht Club development. Right. Which is another development I think is going to have some consequences for the community that are not fully appreciated at this point. How do you like to keep and how do you plan to keep all of your constituents involved in what's happening in the community, what you're thinking, what your thought right. process was? So I was the one who initiated sending out a blast email to my constituents who subscribed to it ahead of time, telling people what's on the agenda and for things that are up for a vote, how I plan to vote. And it, I do that with a purpose and that is, I don't always get it right, and I don't always know all of the, the feelings of the people I represent. And I have, in fact, changed my vote on rare occasion, but I have changed my vote given feedback from those emails. I've been growing that list. I've been grudgingly getting into the 20th century, at least. Um, and my sister and my son are helping me with my Facebook page, and I want to get those things on Facebook so people don't have to come to me to subscribe. I know that's a deficiency that I have to work on, but I think the town hall meet. I enjoy the town hall meetings. They're tough. They take some preparation, but I like talking to my constituents. I want to get a little bit philosophical here on this. We've always heard that there's two Annapolises, 
Mm -hmm. And the goal is to have one in Appleson. At one end of the extreme, we've got the rich white folk that live in the mansions on the water. Right. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you've right. got public housing, uh, subsidized housing with you know, low income, right. primarily African-American or Hispanic right. uh, members of our community. Knowing that one alderman in four years or eight years is not going to be able to close that gap. Um, but one alderman in four years can do something to help close that gap. But what do you think is needed to sort of tighten that up a little bit? Well, first of all, the gap is um, economic reality. Annapolis is a very attractive place and money has might. And so we're never going to take that attractiveness away unless we, we hit a uh, real estate death spiral. We're not going to take that away, but we, uh, and I give um, Mayor Cohen and Mayor Panelides uh, the credit for cueing me in on this. We can't ignore, particularly the public housing and the Section 8 housing. They are here and they're part of the community. They are citizens and we do have to try to help and we have to try to help in a number of ways. So that's why I've been going to the Housing Authority board meetings regularly just to let them know that I'm there, I'm listening, and I'm carrying a message back. And that is a long, slow process. It's one that we have to do. But economic disparity is part of the human condition. And to try to say that we're going to uh, rid that is like saying we're going to walk on water. What we need to do is to make it a fair system where people are recognized and represented fairly. So some of what the Mayor, Mayor Panelidis has done has come with tough love. But there was no reason why housing authorities shouldn't have been inspected and all of these uh, substandard conditions identified and addressed. And, and, and it is, it's slow, it's way too slow. As I said, Newtown 20 is a disaster. I was shocked when I went to the board meeting last month there just to see you know, how it is deteriorated. Alderwoman Finlayson obviously was on this more than I was. Um, but the other things that we can do to make Annapolis more homogeneous is to start working, and Sheila and I share this goal, on more workforce housing. Now, that's a tough bill because no developer in empty or redeveloped space is going to put it out for the lower, the, the lower return on investment. They're going to want to have big Class A apartments and Class A McMansions right. and so forth. We have not done enough, though. We need our city employees to work, be able to work in the city, and they can feel the pinch of the tax burden. And they can have a little bit more empathy because they're now hearing their next-door neighbor complain about what somebody in the city did to them or didn't do for them. So that there's there needs to be a blending across all spectrums. It is glaring the super wealthy, the one percenters, and the super poor, the disadvantaged, and people who are clinging, uh, and they really are, and they feel very threatened. I talked with Andre Atkins about this. He feels very threatened about redeveloping the public housing, even though he knows it'll be a good thing. He's afraid that he'll be displaced, and he doesn't have other options. And so I, some of it, I think, is changing the mindset, recognizing that there will always be people who are well off and there will be people who are very disadvantaged, but at least they all feel like they have a say and they're heard, they have a voice. I don't think people in public housing feel, even now, but certainly not in the past, that they were considered citizens and that they had a voice. So some of this is a mindset as much as a checking account balance. So, and those are long, slow, cultural things that don't stop the gunshots, don't stop traffic, and it's something you just have to work on and plug away on every day. And it's not gonna change overnight, and, and it'll never go away because it's, it's economic reality. But you need to make it a fair system and a, an inclusive system. And that's why I'm a Democrat. As we wrap up, now, now's, now's your time to sort of, sort of pitch me and pitch anybody that's listening here. 
let us give us a little bit of background about who Ross Arnett is, sure. why you want to run, uh, why you think yep. you're the man for the job. And yes. So, I mean, I come with good credentials. I was a senior executive in federal government. I had a wonderful federal government career. I was on the Clinton healthcare reform team, uh, was at the Vanguard on all of the health issues. Very happy with my career, but I think it also gave me a lot of skills. I've always been involved in public life. When I was in college, I was on the Central Student Court at the University of Maryland, College Park. When I got married and moved into a townhouse, I became president of the Townhouse Association. I can't stop myself, I can't help it. It's clearly something I enjoy doing. And I think that what people don't realize and what the new incumbents are not gonna understand is, you don't get any training to be an alderman. It's all on the job training and it's hard work. It's not just learning the code and the charter, it's learning the players and it's learning how the system works. I have that behind me. I still have a lot of things that I think I can get done. I'm really looking forward to working with my returning colleagues, but I'll welcome the new people too. I've, I've had, I'm very impressed with Shanika. I think she's a very bright woman. I think she needs to understand that the city's jobs, the city work isn't jobs, health, and education. We don't do that, but I, I know she's already smart enough. She's already made that. Same thing with Alexis. Rob knows it because he uh, has worked in the city. But the reason I'm running again is because there's work left to do. I think I know how to do it. I'm willing to put it in for four more years, and uh, that's what drives me. Where can we find out more about you? Learn more well, about right, I've, got, so I've, got, I've got a great flyer here, so the, I'm going to read that. Okay, well, the, the back page here has my contact information. I have the city email, Eastport Ross. Um, I now have the campaign email, uh, Ross for Ward 8. Uh, my Facebook is uh, being developed, my Facebook page. My problem isn't so much <laughs> having people figure out how to contact me. My problem is figuring out a way to get back to them because I get... <laughs> tons of email every day right and it's all different all of it requires some thought and response i can tell you i never delete an email it stays there in my ross's uh, eastport ross account right now i have 467 emails unanswered see now that would drive me nuts it drives me nuts too <laughs> and it makes me feel very remiss but you know i have a couple of hundred on my city email i have a couple on the uh uh, Ross is 34, which was my personal email account, but now everybody knows it. Uh, I, I've got to figure out ways to respond more quickly and work smarter. And uh, I think that uh, Facebook and some of those other things may be a way to do it. Although I found that the more information I put out, <laughs> the more requests for information I've generated. So in some ways it's not rewarding. Well, that's your uh, catch. That's your catch twenty two. Right, it is. Um, but if if you'd like to email, it is uh, eastportross at aol dot com. Right, and and aldarnett at annapolis dot gov, and I have an ad on your site, which right. gives people all the contact links. Okay, and the website is ross for ward eight, and that's ross f o r ward and the number eight dot com. And Ross Arnett is the current alderman for Ward 8 in Eastport in the city of Annapolis. We do have a primary election coming up on September 19th. Correct. And then followed up by a general election on November 7th. Correct. You guys will take office in December. Mm -hmm. And then and get to vote on the new market house lease. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. Get out and vote. But anybody that's listening, voting is just so important. And Annapolis historically has a fairly low turnout in the primary. So... It is important. We discuss many of these problems or situations or opportunities with all of them in our net. So you get an idea of what where the importance really is. Get out there, figure out who you want to vote for, and just do it. Yep. September nineteenth is your first chance to do it. That's correct. Thanks for joining me. I sure. appreciate it. Thank you, John. So there you have it. Answers from a candidate or alder person in the city of Annapolis. Did they answer anything that was on your mind? If not, make sure you get in touch with them so you can make the best vote come September 19th in the primary election. 
Be sure to keep up to speed on the election at ionanapolis.net and also on the MarylandCrabs.com. It is an important election this year, so it is so important to get out and vote. And speaking of voting, the primary is on September 19th and the general election is on November 7th. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. And after the primary, look for an announcement from us about a mayoral debate between the two survivors. Just like the forum in June, Ion Annapolis and the Maryland Crabs will bring this to you, but this time it will be structured more as a debate rather than a forum. Thank you for listening to this special election crab cake episode. Be sure to subscribe to the Maryland Crabs podcast. We have fresh stuff that drops every Thursday at noon.